was in elementary school, I dreaded Jim. I dreaded Jim because um, he was never much fun. Of course, I was the, the, the big kid in school, the, 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 the fat boy, the one who was picked on usually for being a little too large. Now, it was okay. I, I, I could always sit on someone if they got me upset. But anyway, it was, it was, there was, just, it was just never fun. And what I hated about Jim was dodgeball and being chosen for teams. That was never fun. And they always chose team captains. The, the, the teacher always chose a team captain that wasn't me. It was always two other people to do the choosing. And they'd start choosing. So team one, I choose Mike. Team two captain, I choose Tom. Team one captain, I, I choose Nevin. Team two captain, I choose Francis. Team one captain, I, I choose Linda. Team two captain, I choose Gene. Oops, maybe I made a mistake. No, I choose John. <laughs> Team one captain, oh, I guess oh, I'll have to take Gene. And team two captain, uh, Oh gosh, we're getting such a few number here now to choose. You know, there's only, there's only a couple left now. Let me see. I guess I'll have to, I guess I'll have to choose Judy. And now there's two final ones. There's the kid with arthritis, Brian. <laughs> and there's the fat kid, Greg. And team one captain is the lucky one. Oh, uh, I choose Brian. <laughs> And then Greg has to go with team two. Oh. Of course, I liked it because dodgeball, if I'm on team two, well, then guess what? I get out, and then I get to go sit down and watch. <laughs> That's, I'll get hit out on the first throw, and we'll be done. The torture will be over with. I hated being chosen because it was usually the case that I was chosen last by default. It's not just that you're chosen last, friends. It's that you're chosen last by default. Oh. Oh, how humiliating. It was awful. And so I praise God. I give thanks and praise to God that we are not chosen last and by default by God. Can I get an amen? amen. We're not chosen last. We're not chosen by default by God. God specifically has chosen you. Specifically chosen you. Now, frankly, it's a surprise that God has chosen any of us. Because in that team uh, selection process, most of us, if it were about being good or being perfect or being the kind of person that we think God wants us to be, we lose, friends. We don't deserve to be chosen. None of us deserve merit being chosen by God to be on God's team. None of us have earned it. None of us can deserve it. There's nothing we can do to earn it. But God has chosen us anyway. Why? Because God loves us. God has chosen us, not because we're pretty, not because we're, not because we're fast, not because we're smart, not because we're rich, not because we're poor. God has chosen us because God loves us. Right there, I wonder if we believe it. We act like it's because we either deserve it or have to deserve it or have to earn it or have to, in some way or other, merit it. But in truth, God chooses us because God loves us. Now, Western theology teaches us to make a decision. It's pretty common in Western, especially Western Protestant theology, that we are called to make a decision to follow Jesus. There's even a wonderful song that I love that, that was uh, very popular back in the 70s and 80s, I think, and it's entitled, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. It talks about making a decision. 
I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Now, right there, those words, I have decided to follow Jesus, that's a, that's a pretty deep commitment that we make. But those aren't the words that strike me the most. And in our theology, they really aren't the words that we're supposed to pay attention to. It's that last phrase. No turning back. No turning back. It's easy to decide to follow Jesus. It's easy to answer Jesus' call, Jesus' choice to follow Jesus. It's a challenge to not turn back back. It's a challenge to keep going, to keep following Jesus. You did not choose me, Jesus said, but I chose you. You have not decided to follow me. I have decided that you are going to follow me. Jesus said. I'm paraphrasing him here. Doesn't mean that we're not supposed to make a response. We are. But the initiative, the divine initiative is with God. And before you say, Greg, that's Calvinism. No, it's not. It's straight out of John Wesley, Wesley and Arminian theology. It's, just, it's straight out of Methodist, the core of Methodist theology. I've preached about it here many times. Brian has spoken about it. It's the concept of pre- Venient grace. Grace is God's unearned, unmerited, undeserved love and favor. There's nothing you can do to earn it or deserve it. It is God's choice of you, made out of love. Grace is God's unearned, undeserved, unmerited love and favor. And it goes before us to prepare the way for us. It is prevenient before going. It's from the Greek word for to go before, to go ahead of. The Latin word, not Greek. The Latin word. To go ahead of. Prevenient. To go before, to go ahead of. To move ahead of. And God's grace moves ahead of us to prepare the way for us. God's grace, God's prevenient grace is like an appetizer for the love of God. It gets us ready to want to feast on the riches of His grace. It's like that salad that you have before lunch. It's like the fried cheese and marinara that you're going to have before lunch. It's, 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 it, it, oh. it's like those chips and salsa that you're going to have before lunch. It gets you hungrier for the love of God. Prevenient grace gets you ready to feast on the whole grace, the marvelous meal of the love of God that is laid before us. Prevenient grace, the before-going grace of God, is that element of God's will that says, I choose you. You haven't done anything to deserve it or earn it. I choose you. You did not choose me, but I chose you. In biblical terms, prevenient grace is the grace of the good shepherd who leaves the 99 and goes for the one that is lost, the one that has gone astray, the one that has turned back, has decided to follow and now turned back, the one who had never been found before. Prevenient grace is the love of the good shepherd who goes out to seek the last, the least, and the lost, and to gather them in and put them on their sh his shoulders and then bring them to the flock. Prevenient grace is the grace of God that goes out after the other sheep, as we talked about a couple weeks ago, goes after the other sheep and gathers them in and adds them to the flock where they'd never been before. Prevenient grace is the grace and the love of God that seeks us out when we've turned back, that seeks us out when we're lost, that seeks us out when we've never been part of the family before, and gathers us in, calls us in, woos us and draws us and makes us want to come and respond and decide to follow Jesus. It is our response. 
our response to the love and the grace of God. It's our response to God saying, I choose you, for us to say, I choose you, I decide to follow Jesus. And that's what Jesus is reminding us of here. We may think we've chosen Jesus, but the truth is that Jesus has chosen us and has given us a commandment, a specific commandment, a commandment that cannot be denied, a commandment that cannot be missed. It's right there in black and white or in red if you have a red-letter Bible. It is right there in Jesus' words. And what is his commandment? This is my commandment, that you obey the discipline and pay your apportionments in full every year, right? No. Sorry, district superintendent. No. I wish he were here today. No. This is my commandment, that you don't violate any of the rules of the discipline that organize our church. Right? No. Did you know that there are at least 25 regulations in the book of discipline that 95% of all clergy ignore or don't even know are there? I'll give you an example. For 27 years of ministry, before coming here, There is a regulation of the discipline that I never did once. And it's turning over to the Conference Board of Higher Education and Campus Ministry the list of all students in your church who have graduated high school and are going off to college. Huh? Yep, the discipline says all pastors are supposed to take a, make a list of all students in your congregation who are graduating from high school and going off to college, and you are to send that list to the Conference Board of Higher Education and Campus Ministry. And I never did it once until I came here. And Mark and now Brian made me do it. Thank you, Brian. You can't charge me for that one now. <laughs> There's another one that's almost never done. When somebody moves, when some member of the congregation moves to someplace else in the world, we are supposed to make every effort possible. We're supposed to contact the pastor of the churches in the area where that person moves to. We're supposed to contact the district superintendent of the district into which that person is moving to and let them know that this person, this Christian, this member of the family of God is moving to that area and they need ministry. A survey was done of clergy to see how many had done that. And of the 23,000 United Methodist clergy in the denomination, fewer than 1% ever, ever, ever did it. And it, I wasn't part of that 1%. There are plenty of things that we don't do. We don't do. We, we forget to do. We don't even know we're supposed to do. So no, the commandment of Jesus is not to obey the discipline and pay your apportionments and all that other stuff. No, that's junk. That's nonsense. That's church stuff. Okay, this is my commandment, that you're perfect. That you never sin. Ooh. Okay, Greg, that's now getting closer. But Jesus doesn't say that. Jesus says, I have loved the Father and kept his commandments, and now I give you this commandment. This is my commandment, that you love one another. There's a wonderful song about this. Um, the composer of the musical notation and the arranger of it is a fellow named Richard L. Van Oss, who was born in like 1953, so it's fairly recent, but I've heard this for a long time. And of course, the words come from Jesus himself. This is my commandment, that you love one another, that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another, that your joy may be full. That your joy may be full. That your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another, that your joy may be full. That's from Jesus, friends. Commandment of Jesus. 
And when we love one another, Christ abides in us. And we abide in Christ. And our joy, our joy is full. Jesus tells us that we're called to love one another. He says that I don't call you servants. I call you my friends. And you have a great duty, a great responsibility, a great calling. I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. We're called to be fruit bearers and lovers of one another caring for one another, praying for one another, serving one another. We're called to love one another. And Jesus says, as I have loved you, he gave himself for us. We're called to love one another. My prayer for you, my friends, is that we love one another as a family of God. If we love one another, if we serve with one another, if we contend with one another, if we pray with one another, if we speak with one another with joy and peace, and if we pray for one another in love, then our joy will be full. And Christ's joy in us will be full. My prayer for you in these coming weeks and months and years is that you will love one another serve together pray with and for each other partake of the means of grace together and be an expression of God's love for those outside these walls this is my commandment that you love one another you haven't chosen me, Jesus says. I have chosen you. And he's chosen us to love one another. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. been listening to a sermon by Dr. Gregory Neal, Senior Pastor of the First United Methodist Church in Commerce, Texas, and Rector of Grace Incarnate Ministries. Copyright 2018 by Dr. Gregory S. Neal. All rights reserved. For more information and for other sermons by Dr. Neal, visit us on the web at www.revneal.org. That's www.revneal.org. You are also invited to visit us in person at First United Methodist Church, 1709 Highway 24, Commerce, Texas, 75428. This program was produced by Dr. Greg Neal.